Now, the reason I'm pumped up and excited today is to continue on in our message, in our series uh, that we've been in. We're in, in, the, in a series in the book of Ephesians. The series is called Growth, and how every single one of us, how we can all have a next step in our relationship with God. Now, today, as Pastor Brent mentioned, we're doing a series within a series. So we're going to do a little three-part series within the book of Ephesians uh, in our growth series. And this mini-series is called I Love My Church. Now, the reason I want to talk about this is because, you know, we're going to talk about the significance of the church. We're going to talk about how much God loves his church, not a building, the people in the church, and the significance of what God wants to do, not just in our life, but through our life when we live, when we live the way that he intended and created for us to live. So it's going to be, uh, again, I'm so pumped up and excited for this next three-part series. And today, the message for today is going to be called, What It Means to Be a Christian. Now, before we get started with that, would you please pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for just uh, such an amazing day and the fact that we get together today, Father, to learn more about taking our next step in our relationship with you. Father, this idea of, of people not understanding what it means to be a Christian or sometimes, Father, people don't understand exactly what the church is. I pray that today we can get some clarity and that every single one of us will take our next step in our relationship with you. Help us, Father, to have an open heart, open mind to the message. And because of that, you know, we would just, uh, you know, move forward in the way that you created and intended for us to. Father, we pray this honor, Son, Jesus' name. Amen. So again, if you want to take out your notes out of your program there, you see that your title for today's message is What It Means to Be a Christian. That, you know, this week is part one of this message. Now, here's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about specifically what God wants to do in our life, but then also what God wants to do through our life and the impact that he wants us to have. And we're going to talk about the church, the church as a whole. Because oftentimes what we do is we, we have a, a, um, a, a bad idea or, or we don't truly understand uh, oftentimes what the church is. You know, I've been in ministry now for over 15 years. And in those 15 years, I've asked people, both people who are Christians and people who are not Christians, I say, can you tell me, you know, what the church is? Like, what is the church in your eyes? It's, it's wild what people will say. You know, people say, you know, things like, oh, it's just, the, you know, it's a building that you go to. There's one in uh, almost every corner, like a Walgreens. You know, uh, there, you know there's, uh, you know, there people go there when they, when, when they, when they need someone to hang on to, you know. Uh, you know or, or people go to church on Sunday when they have nothing better to do, you know, because there's no games on, there's no football, you know. So, they, you know, kind of go to church on Sunday. You know, church is a place where kind of good people go is something what people say is like you kind of go there it's kind of the good thing to do i guess just kind of go there and do that it, people look at church as being kind of the the life insurance they look at it as hell insurance right you know i go to church why because just in case i can go to heaven you know i mean so people have all these different ideas sometimes people say you know and they'll be brutally honest you know church is a place where you go again when you're not too busy or you're not too tired from the night before because you partied all night or you're or you're you know you're sobered up and you got up the next morning and decided to go to this place and just be around you know a bunch of other people that try, are trying to sober up the next day you know and 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 they or, or they look at the, the church as a theater they, you know like they go to a movie theater and they and they're there to watch a show for a little while they, they enjoy it for a little bit, but then they move on. You know, it's kind of like I put my time in, and that's pretty much it. But here's what I want to show you today. All those are not right. None of those things are right. The church is not a place that you attend. It's not a place that you go to. The church is a family you belong in. And we're going to show that today. We're going to show you what God says the church truly is. We're going to talk about why the church is important to us. And ultimately, the difference that God wants to make in and through our lives, the Christians that are and make up God's church. So let's go ahead and get started by looking at our key text for today. Again, we've been talking about, you know, how God uh, brought peace over the last couple weeks through the Jews and the the Gentiles, how he brought these two people together through his church. And now what we're going to talk about again is we're going to see that the Apostle Paul looks at this group, the Gentiles, people who were non-Jewish, people who were uh, very pagan in in their life and in their belief before they were taught about Jesus. These people were chasing after all the wrong things. They were committed to sex and money. It was all about their own wants, their own desires. And now, you know, they learned about Christ, and now Christ is transforming their life. And the Apostle Paul in that says this. Now, let's talk about how and what God wants to do in and through your life in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Here's what it says. It's also in the box there in your notes. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints And are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. 
So there's so much in here, but here's what I want you to understand out of this text, okay? There are three specific analogies that the Apostle Paul uses here to the Ephesians, to people who are non-Jewish, which is most of us here today. He says, you have to understand that here is what a Christian is, and here's what the church is. It starts off by talking about a nation. That's the first analogy. The next thing he talks about is that the family of God is, it really is a family. And then he goes into, and the last analogy he uses is that it's a building. So it's a nation, a family, and a building. There's a progression of what he's walking us through. He's talking about the church as a whole, that, you know, Christians all around the world as a whole are a part of this nation of God. And then he talks about now the local church and the family that you get to be a part of right here at Unleash, the family. And then he talks about this building that God is using this family to build something incredible that is life and eternally transforming, which is what God wants to do through your life. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, we're going to talk about those three analogies. And the first analogy that we're going to talk about is the fact that we are a part of this awesome eternal nation of God, which is a group of Christians. Let's go ahead and look at the first thing on your notes. Again, it says there, we are not who we used to be. We're not who we used to be. Let's go ahead and look at the text again. We're going to look at verse, just verse 19 right now. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens of this nation with the saints, with other Christians. And then, and then the, the next part will come, come in, the, in the second part there. So it says there that we are Right now, no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Now, this is awesome because here's what he's talking about then. When it says, so then, so then, whenever you see a so then, it's it's tying into what happened before. If you remember, what he's tying into is what we talked about for the last couple of weeks, that there was all this animosity and all these issues and all these problems between the Jews and the Gentiles. There was all kinds of racial tension. There was all kinds of, of, of religious tension. And because of that, there was complete separation, these barriers that were there. But through Jesus, last week we talked about those barriers were completely blown, up, blown away. And then now we get to be together in God's church, that it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're Native American. It doesn't matter where you come from that we are all equal in God's church, each and every single one of us. So we talked all about that last week. Now this week it says there, now remember this, that before you formerly were strangers and aliens. Now the word stranger means you didn't know. See, if someone's a stranger to you, you don't know them. You don't know them on a personal level. Now the alien part is that you don't belong. So you didn't know God and you didn't belong to God's family. So we were all there. At some point, every single one of us, because of our sin, because of our, you know, going in the wrong direction, we've all been separated from God. But then he says, but that's not who you are anymore. That now through Jesus, it says you are fellow citizens with the saints, with other Christians. He says, yes, you go back and you look at your life. Remember we talked about the history of the Gentiles? It was ugly. I'm talking about capital U-G-L-Y. You ain't got no L by you ugly. I mean, it was horrible. When you looked at what they were involved with, it was horrible. And he says, now... You people that had that horrible past, through Christ, you're one with these people that people look up to. How awesome is that? That through Jesus, all of that gets wiped away, and we get to start over in our relationship with God. And we get to be a part of this thing called the nation of God, which is a body of Christians throughout the entire world. See, he's reminding them that God has a bigger plan and a bigger purpose for their life. He's reminding them now, when you are a part of a nation— you get certain benefits of being a part of that nation. You know, for example, if someone comes here, they migrate here to the United States, like my parents. Okay, my parents, um, they, they, they came here on a work visa. They then, uh, you know, got a, a, a card. It was called the green card. And the green card, actually, if you read it, it actually says uh, resident alien. That's the actual card. That it's, it says resident alien. See, so what it's saying there is you don't really belong, but you're kind of hanging out here for a little while. But then when they became citizens, what ends up happening is when you become a citizen, now you have, uh, you know, more privileges, more things. Like you have, you have, you can vote. There are certain things that come with being a citizen of a nation. One of the biggest things that you get from a citizen, because think about it, people come here and they want to become citizens of the United States for, for several reasons. Number one is opportunity. They want to be blessed with opportunity. Maybe where, where they're from, they don't have those opportunities. The, you, know, you know, work and, and to, you know, to, to, to live the American dream. Maybe the, maybe the other thing is, is protection. There are people that come here as refugees that, that come here for protection. Why? Because we got some big guns, 
right? I mean, the United States, we have some amazing military that backs up the United States. So they're going, you know what, over here, we don't have that. But we come to the United States, yes, their guns are bigger than theirs, you know? So, so our guns are bigger than theirs. So because of that, they come for protection. Let me tell you something. There's no one that can protect you better than God. So when we become citizens of the nation, the, the, uh, the body of believers as Christians to God, God says, you get my protection, you get my direction, I'm going to do some amazing things in and through your life. See, that's the amazing thing it says. It's the very first thing. You used to be strangers. You used to be aliens. But now you're a citizen of, some, of, a, of something that is incredible. The only thing that goes beyond this life. How awesome is that? That's what we get to be a part of. So that's what it means to be a Christian. Number one, the nation. Now let's look at the second thing, which is now we are also part. We are family. All right? We are family. Come on. I got all my sisters with me. Oh, uh, my, my, my wife actually corrected me on that because I was like, you know, I was saying we, we are family, all my brothers and sisters with me. And she, she's all, that's not what it says. And I was like, okay, I, I always make up all kinds of words when I sing. So, all right. Um, so, so the next part is this. He starts off by saying we're a part of a, of a nation of Christians. But now he's talking about the local church and how we as a local church right here, Unleashed Christian Church, we are. Our family. Listen to what it says here again. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Here it is. And are of God's household. See, now he's talking about this household. He's talking about a family. When you are a part of someone's household, you are a part of their family. See, there's all kinds of benefits to being a, being a citizen in kind of a corporate level, but, but you don't get the interpersonal stuff. So this now talks about more of an intimate relationship. That now you are around other people where you can do life together. That's what the local church is about. It's about belonging to a family. You know, so he's saying there that, yes, there's benefits as far as being a part of a nation, but there's huge relational benefits of being a part of a family. See, the Apostle Paul says, you used to be a stranger, but now you're family. You used to be excluded, but now you're included. See, you know what church is on Sunday? It's a family get-together. That's what we do here on Sunday mornings, is we do a family get-together. Now, I don't know about you, I love family get-togethers. Uh, I love having people come over to our house, have family come to our house, have close friends come. To, now, if you guys know this, you know, when you get close friends, you guys come over, you, I treat you like family. I mean, we do. We, we hang out. We, you know, I love getting together. You know, you can have barbecues, you eat together, you hang out, you can listen to music, you're, you know, you know, slip and sliding, you're swimming, whatever it is, you hang out with them. You know what, you know when you're around family, you know what you are? You're comfortable. You're comfortable. Sometimes you laugh together, sometimes you cry together, you share with each other, you're committed to one another, you do life together. Exactly. That's what God's church is. That's what the local church is. We're a family. Every Sunday when we come together, you know what we're doing? We're having a big old family reunion. Now, how awesome is this? Think about that. How, how often do you, when you have a family get-together, have a band a part of that every single time? You know when? Every Sunday because you're a part of this family. I mean, how awesome is that? They, they rock out. We have, we, people ask, why do you have food here at the church? Why do you have food here at the church? Why? Because family eats together. That's why. Why do we have all these events after church? Because families hang out together. That's why. See, we're not confused about what we are. we are. We are a part of God's household. We are family. And there's commitment that's there. Now, one of the things that family does as well is family works together. Like, for example, if I'm going to have, like, a barbecue for just people I don't really know, like, we just invite people to come over, I don't ask them to do anything. When they come through the doors, we say, hey, relax. They're like, oh, here, I'll pick this up. No, no, we'll get that for you. We're, we're good. We'll get that for you. you. You're our guest. You relax. But when family comes, comes over, you know what you do? You hand them the dishes. Hey, we're, we're all working on this together, right? I mean, think about this. When, when you have people that you don't re re really know come over to your house, when they leave, your house is a mess, and you're left to clean it up all yourself. But when you have family over, before they leave, you know what they're doing? Here, let me help you wipe this thing down. I love that. I love when we have stuff at our house and, and people that, are, that we're really close with, and they'll, they'll, before they're walking out, they're like, oh, here, let me help wipe this down. Let me, let me take these dishes. And I'm like, no, no, it's okay. We got that. And they're like, what? No, I'm going to help. You know why? Because we're family. Exactly. You want to know why this church functions the way it does? Because there's so many people here that understand that we're family and we work together. They're serving in classrooms right now watching your kids. They're serving in the cafe you know, putting that nice smell of bacon and eggs throughout the, in the air. 
They're, they're, they're welcoming people as they come through the doors saying, hey, we're happy you're here. They're working in production right now, and then some of them work throughout the week getting things set up. The band comes in on Tuesday nights, gives up their Tuesday nights. Every single Tuesday night comes in here and practices and gives up hours of time. Why? Because they're saying, I'm, I'm rolling up my sleeves. We're family. We do what we got to do. See, that's what we do as a church. See, too often what ends up happening is when we believe the church is just a place we go to, we get this consumer mindset. Consumer mindset is you're, you're kind of like you're here just to purchase stuff. You go to Walmart to go purchase something. You go to Target. You go to, you know, Ross or you go to McFrugal's or Michael's, whatever. I don't, there's all kinds of stores. I can't think of the, all the ones right there on Irvington. You know, there's, there's a lot of stores there. But here's the thing is that if you don't find what you want there, you know what you do? Oh, I'll just go over here. And I'll just go over here. See, there's this mindset that happens in people where they're, where, you know, the, 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 a family isn't a church shopper. I, you know, a family says, you know what? We know everything's not perfect here. You know why it's not going to be perfect in the church? You know why? Because the church is run by imperfect people. There's only one that was perfect, and that's Jesus. That's it. That's the one we serve. But ultimately, we are all imperfect people here for each other, but we're family. You know what a family does? A family looks at that imperfect person and says, hey, but I'm still committed to you. I, re- you know, I read this book, and I got to tell you, it's an amazing book. It's called Stop Dating the Church. Stop Dating the Church. And what it talks about is how Christians, even Christians, are church daters. Here's what they do. They'll come to church, and they're here, and when you're dating someone, here's what you're doing. You're kind of trying to weigh it all out, seeing if, if they're really worth it. You know, when you're dating someone, you're kind of going, you know, I like them, but I'm not sure I'm ready to commit to them. When you're dating somebody, what you're saying is, you know, you know I, I like a lot of things about them, but if a better deal comes along, <laughs> you know, I, there's no real commitment. I can move over to this other relationship. But once you get married to an individual, everything changes. There's commitment there. And this book says, you know what? As Christians, we got to stop dating the church and marry it. Show commitment to it. Because I think about the fact that, you know, I've been married to my wife now for, you know, almost 19 years in January. 19 years she's put up with me. Yeah, give her a round of applause. Yeah. She's had to deal with this crazy guy for a long time. Don't worry. She went to therapy. We're good. You know, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know, but, but here's the thing is that there's a certain level, I mean, there's a massive level of commitment that happens when you go from dating to marriage. Because I got to tell you, I was a runner. Back in the day when I was dating somebody, and as soon as I saw that there was something about them I didn't like, I was out of there. I was running. I was running, Jenny. I mean, I, w- I-, I was gone out of that situation. You know, there was times when girls, they were like, oh, I'm going to marry you. And I'm like, mm, you're crazy. Some of them did turn out to be crazy. You know, but, but I was. As soon as I found something wasn't right, what I would do is, I, because I, I, di- I didn't have the commitment, I would run. And I still remember this. There was one time where Kim and I, when we were dating, and we got an argument. And she got mad at me. And I went, I'm out of here. And I, was, I started driving away. And so, and it, so I got in my truck, and I started driving away. She got in her car. She followed me. She goes, oh, no, you didn't. And I, I was like, huh? And she's like, oh, we're not giving up that easy. And I'm like, okay, I guess we're not. Okay, I'm going to marry you. You know, but... No, but, but I got to tell you that that's the thing is this, is that we, and now I've been married to my wife for, for 19 years. And just so you know, I'm so glad that she did that because that would have been the biggest mistake of my life. And, and so my wife and I, we, you know, over the years, here's what we learned, especially on the day that we got married. Here's what we said. We went from dating going, I can be out of here. I can just get in my truck and drive away. We went from that to making these vows to one another. You know what a vow is? It's a commitment to that person. And we said in sickness and in health, for richer and for poorer, through good times and the bad, tell what? Tell death do us part, tell I kill you. You know, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. You know, no, but here's what it says there is this, is that he, what we said is we are committed to each other. And now I'm not looking for something else. We're going to make this work. And yes, we're going to have hard times. And we're going to have issues. And we're going to argue sometimes. But we're committed and we're working through it. Commitment is what changes everything. Exactly. The same thing is true in God's church. You want to go take your relationship with God to a whole other level? Don't just attend a church. Commit to it. See, that's what we start seeing now. Now we start seeing the difference between being a church attender and being an active member of God's family. That's what that means. So don't just come and and listen to the teaching, go, I want to see if pastors be funny today, and then walk out. Be a part of it. Listen, every single week we tell you that there's ways and opportunities for you to be an active member of the church. Listen, it's right here on your Get Connected card. On the back of it has every ministry that you can be a part of. God has gifted every single one of us individually, and, and, and he wants us to be an active part of his church. Sign up. Be a part. 
of God's family actively. And listen, hey, sometimes you know what it means? It means picking up the trash. It means doing, I still remember the first time I signed up at a church, and I remember going, God is real. I'm going to give my life to him. And I, and, and I did, and I started going to church regularly. I went up to a pastor, and I said, look, I just want to help. I'll do whatever I got to do. And I was like, look, I, I'll be a part of the, the trash pickup team. That's what I did. When I first started going there, right when church was over, I'd go around and empty out the trash cans. That's what I did. And I got to tell you, there was no shame in that. You know why? Because I was being an active member of God's family. There is no job too high or no jo- job too low. We're all equal, and we're a part of this thing. So again, we encourage you to be a part of it and sign up on that Get Connected card. So that's the first, no, the first two. The first one is, again, we're a part of the nation of God, which is a g- large group of Christians all around the world. We then, now through the local church, through right here, Unleashed Christian Church, we get to be a part of the family of God. We get to know each other on a family basis. Now we get into now the third analogy, which is a building. So let's go ahead and look at that now in the next par- par- uh, point, if you want to turn over your notes, that Jesus Christ is our corner, cornerstone. And we're talking about this, this building analogy for the next two points. All right, so it says here in verse 20 and 21, it says, so again, we're all part of God's family. And it says, uh, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So it's, all this is talking about is that the apostles and prophets, they, they, that they laid the foundation by telling us the truth about Jesus. Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, that Jesus Christ is this cornerstone. We'll come back to that here in a second. In whom the whole building is being fitted together and is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So it says there, it talks about that Jesus Christ is this cornerstone. A cornerstone. Now, a cornerstone is massive during this time. See, today we don't even know what that is. We're like a cornerstone. What is that, a, st- a stone that's just on the side of the corner? I don't, I don't know what that is. See, you know, when we build houses today, we don't use cornerstones anymore. What we do is we take a bunch of chemicals and minerals, and we make this big concrete slab, and then we put wood on it. We put them up, and we put stucco on the outside, and those houses last about, you know, 50 years, and then they start falling apart. Back then, they would build the uh, houses and b- structures out of these big, giant boulders and stones, and they, some of those are still standing today. So you can see that they're built a whole lot better than we see today. Day. And the key for, for a building back at that time was this thing called the cornerstone. And these people at that time, they knew what that was. You know, I, I looked up, I was looking on Google for, to show you a picture of a cornerstone. I, saw, I actually saw this one. This one was really cool just because I like the engraving where it says, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Now, I love that. Especially, I specifically love that stone because of how perfect it is. And I'll tell you why that's important here in a second. But this actual stone doesn't really show what a true cornerstone was. Because a true cornerstone wasn't up elevated like that in a building. A true cornerstone was more like this, this graphic rendering here where it has that big one right at the bottom. Right? You know, it was, this cornerstone was the biggest, most important piece of a building. It was a foundational stone. Now, being a foundational stone, here's what it needed. It had to be perfect. That this stone had to have every perfect cut on it because everything was going to measure off of it. It also had to be strong. Why? Because the entire weight of the structure rests all on this thing called the cornerstone. Now think about that. Jesus Christ is saying that he is the cornerstone of our life. So what does that mean? It means first and foremost that we measure our life from him. See, too often what we do is we we measure our Christians, we can measure ourselves uh, from other people. And, and we think that as long as I'm better than that person, I'm okay. But other people aren't where we measure from. What we measure from is what we always go back to Jesus. You know, it's not what, what would Juan do. That's not what the J stands for. What would Jesus do? See, he's the one we measure from. You know why? Because if you measure from other people, soon you're going to end off in the wrong direction. It's kind of like this. You know, I, I love doing projects at my house. I have a lot of projects that I've started, a couple I've finished, you know. But, um, and one of the things with my projects, I remember there was one time I was cutting up, uh, you know, pieces of wood, and someone told me, showed me this trick. They said, look, if you take a piece of wood and you measure it out perfectly, you don't have to keep measuring every single cut. If you have to cut a bunch of the same one, what you do is you measure one, and you use that one, and, and you mark it, and then you cut again. And you use it again, you mark again. Now, I made a mistake. And the mistake that I made was this, is that when I was trying to cut this, I, I set it down, and I, and I marked it, and then I, and then I went to cut it, and I put the, 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 the original one aside. So then I cut that one, and I used the one I cut to cut the next one. So then I, 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 I uh, marked it, and I took that one, set it aside, cut it, and I used the one I cut and used that one as a measuring thing. Now, here's what was wild. I did not take into account that when you do that, the blade width takes away from that cut. So little by little, by the time I was done, I was like a half inch to three quarters of an inch off on the last one. I'm going, what just happened? Yes, I'm an engineer. You know, I'm like, I I don't get it. What just happened here? 
And then I realized what happened. If I would have used the, the one that was perfect every single time to measure, the cuts would have been good. But because I didn't, I used all the other ones, everything was off. Same thing is true as we look at our life and our relationship with God. See, your next step is different than that person's next step and that person's next step and that person's next step. You, you have a next step and your next step needs to be based on, let's see what Jesus would do here. How would, you know, let's go back to understanding what Jesus would do. Because you know what we'll do is we, we will make excuses for us doing something we shouldn't do. Why? Because, hey, that Christian did it. Don't we do that often? Hey, I'm not as bad as that guy, so J Jesus loves me more because that guy's jacked up. You know, not realizing that we're all messed up. See, that's the thing is this, is Jesus is the one we measure from. And you understand that when Jesus is the one we measure from. We all fall short. Listen to what it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, about not measuring ourselves with other people. It says, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. It says, that's not wise. Don't use other sticks to measure along because you're going to see by the time you're done, your relationship with God will be so far off from where it needs to be. But instead, always go back to what would Jesus do? But the other thing is this. The cornerstone was also in, it used to, to handle all the weight of that structure, the structure of the building. Isn't that important for us? Because let's admit, there are times in our life when we feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. When we feel that we're in the middle of a situation, maybe it's a, it's a family situation. Maybe we have a loss of a family member. Maybe there's somebody that's sick. Maybe, maybe there's a, a financial issue. Maybe we're arguing within family, and we feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders, and we feel like we just can't do it. Let's admit, there are times when that's, life's going to feel that way. I remember with myself, one of the things that I remember was back when I was in, in uh, junior high school. We, we, did this, we did this game. It was a, a kickball game, right? And, and kickball, I was pretty good at it. I was pretty good. In kickball, all you do is this. You kick the ball. You run around the base. Yes, yeah, so it wasn't very intelligent there. You know, but, but I was pretty good at this unintelligent game. So what I did is, is you would kick the ball, you would run. And one, one time we were down. And we were down by one point. And I was like, that's it. There was somebody on base. There was two outs. And I'm like, oh, we got to do this. We got to do this. So, so I got up there, and I was the one kicking. And I kicked it. I kicked the side, and the ball curved. Yes, I didn't mean to do that, but hey, I'll take it. You know, but, the, but the ball curved over. It went over the guy's head, bounced, and I was gone. And, you know, I ran all the way around. I came in. The guy came in. I came in. Woo! We won the game. We won the game. My friends came up to me. They jumped on me. I fell over. And all of a sudden, they started dogpiling on me because we won the game. And even people from the other team started dogpiling on top. I'm like, hey, what's going on? You're not even on our team. But, but here's what happened. After this dogpile, I was underneath there, and I, I couldn't breathe. I was literally getting crushed under there. And I'm like, get off of me. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. If you've ever been dogpiled, I still have nightmares about that. You know, it, it's crazy. Dogpiles are horrible if you're the guy that's at the bottom. See, there are times when we just can't handle the weight. But Jesus said here, it's not your weight to handle. He says that he's the chief cornerstone. He's the one that the weight rests on. So this is why verses start to make sense to us. Like in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, where it says there, cast your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. You know, Jesus can handle the weight. Whatever you're feeling, whatever anxiety, whatever struggle, whatever issue, it says, let him handle it. He can take it. Then you, Jesus made us a promise about how he takes the weight off of our shoulders. And listen to what he says he gives us in return. If you look here in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, listen to what it says here. It says, Jesus, this is Jesus talking. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, that you have this burden on your shoulders. You know what? If that's you today, he's talking to you right now. And, get, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest, not just for your physical bodies, but you will find rest for your souls, that he gives you a peace that goes beyond all comprehension, for my yoke is easy. Here it is. And my burden is light. Jesus says, I'll help lift the weight. Give it to me. The weight of the world is not on your shoulders. Focus on me. I can handle it as your cornerstone. Now, that's one of the huge benefits of being a part of God's family and being built, God, what God is building in our life. But listen, let's look at the next thing, which is talking about now how we can be active members of God's church. We are a part of something amazing. Let's go ahead and look at verses 21 and 22. It says this. So again, it talks about that Jesus Christ himself is being the, the cornerstone in whom, so talking about Jesus, 
the whole building is being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So those are key words. Fitted together and growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also, so those are three things I want you to focus on, fitted together, uh, growing into, and then that you also are being built together into the dwelling of God in the Spirit. So let's talk about these three things that the Apostle Paul talks about here. The first thing he talks about is that we are all being fitted together. Here's what this means. In God's family, you fit in. No matter how messed up you are, no matter how broken you are, you fit in God's family. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. No matter how broken you think you are, God says, I have the perfect place for you. If you look in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, it says there, you meant this for evil, but God would use this for good so that by this very moment, many people shall be saved. See, what that t- tells us is this, is that even there are times in our brokenness that we feel like, you know what, there's no way I can fit into God's family. There's no way I can fit in because of all my past and all my brokenness and all the bad decisions I've made. God says, you know what, you fit in right here. If you've never thought you fit in before, you do in God's church. The other thing that we're talking about being fitted, being fitted also during this time, what they would do to fit something is that they would actually chip away at some of the stones. Because if there was a time when there was a stone that needed to be, you know, that, that, was, that there was a hole in the wall, and they were going to put that stone in there, and it didn't fit perfectly, you know what they would do is they would chip away at it. Kind of like when I worked on my landscape in my backyard, I did a big section of pavers by myself. And one of the things that I would do is I did a, this curve uh, on the landscape, and, and, you know, pavers aren't curved. So I did the, all the straight ones, and then what I had to do is I took the pavers, and I followed the curve, and I marked it, and I took my, um, my grinder with the diamond blade, and I just cut it, you know, took the chunk that I didn't need out, and then I made it fit perfectly. So there's some thing, there's some stuff on that I need to chip away to make it fit perfectly. You know, the same thing is true in our life. That there are some things that God is chipping away in your life. It's that brokenness. It's that sin. It's that stuff that's keeping you away from ultimately living your life of purpose that God intended for you to have. See, the Bible describes this chipping this, this sh- as a sharpening process. If you look in Proverbs 27, 17, it tells us that God sharpens us through his Holy Spirit. But Proverbs 27, 17 says that he also sharpens us through us, through other people. It says that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That together we sharpen each other. That we help each other. That we get rid of the stuff that's, that's stopping us from being that active member of God's family. That, that perfect peace that God wants to have in, in his church that will make an eternal difference. Now i got to tell you, sometimes that's hard. Because think about it. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. If you're sharpening iron, you know what happens sometimes? Sometimes there's heat. Sometimes there's sparks. But the end result is you have something that is worthwhile. Exactly. Sometimes when we're sharpening each other, we know that there's arguments, there's things that happen, but ultimately the end result is something incredible. I remember when I first was um, getting ready to go into ministry, and I was being mentored by a pastor, and I was going through my study, and I was being mentored by him, and as I was being mentored by him, he would call me into his office like almost every week, call me into his office, he's like, hey Juan, and I'm like, hey, how you doing? And I thought I had a great week. He's like, well, let me tell you some of the things that you did wrong. And I'm like, okay, and he'd go boom, 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 I'm like, Turn over the notes. Doom, doom, doom. Let me turn it I mean, I mean, it was insane. I, I, there was a point where there was this sharpening, and the whole point is he was trying to help me. He was trying to help me. And I remember asking him one day. I seriously, I asked him this exact thing. I said, are you sure that I should be in ministry? <laughs> because I think I'm doing pretty good trying to follow God, but there's a whole lot more. And he said, there's a difference between being a Christian and being a leader in God's church. And what we're doing is we're sharpening you. There's some things here that need to be chipped away. You're hanging on to some anger. You're hanging on to some resentment. You're hanging on to some things here that we need to, we need to work on. And if you're going to be used by God, we've got to take care of all that stuff. It's not until later on I realized that, that, was, that God was doing something amazing in my life. Now, I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm far from it. God is still chipping away. There's a lot that God is still going to chip away in my life. But the reality is this, is that God is continuing to work on that. If God stops, stops chipping, it's because he can't use you anymore. The reason he's chipping is because he wants to use you to fit in perfectly into his ultimate goal and purpose, which is to change the world. You notice what it said there? It said that, that the church is growing in Christ. Growing. See, that's the thing. The church needs to grow. From the very beginning, you know that, that, that we don't apologize here at Unleashed Christian Church and we have a lot of people come to church. And the fact that we have three services. And the fact that someday we hope to go to four services. And the fact that we will do whatever we have to do to help reach more people for Jesus. We're, you know, there are times when people have gotten mad at me saying, you know what, I don't like it that the church is getting bigger. You know, I, I liked it when I just knew the first few, you know, just a couple people around here. And I said, then you don't understand something that we're not here to just be this cozy little hangout group of people because Jesus Christ gave the church a thing called the Great Commission. And I got to 
to tell you that here at Unleashed Christian Church, we are a great commission church where Jesus said this, you know, all authority, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of but what? Of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to obey all that I've commanded you, and lo, I will be with you to the very end of the age. Jesus Christ says this, that the church should be something that's growing. You know why? Because every time that someone steps foot into God's church, they're, they're taking a step closer in their relationship with God. And that is the soul that Jesus Christ loves. That is another person that Jesus Christ gave up his life for. And we should actively be wanting to grow God's church and make a difference in it. Now, the, one of the questions that we often have is people say, well, but I'm just one person. How can I possibly do that? And I got to tell you, I was there. A while back, I remember going, I... Look, I'm a beat-up stone. <laughs> How can I possibly be, you know, you know, something significant in God's church, the church, to make a difference for him? And here's what I realized. See, if you take a stone by itself and lay it aside, it's just a, it's just a rock. There's nothing very significant about it. But if you take a stone and you put it in the right hands, something amazing can happen, like this building right here. All that is is stones in the right hands. If you take us, a bunch of stones, and we operate in God's hands, and we operate the way God intended and created for us to operate, God's church, we get to be a part of something absolutely incredible, something with meaning and purpose, something that is life and eternally transforming. We all get to be a part of that. But the way that happens, those are all a bunch of stones that are doing something united. That's how we do it. We do it united. Not that we think the same, but that we think together, that the ultimate goal of what we're here to do is to help, is to, is to allow God to make a difference in our life and allow God to make a difference through our life. When we do that, God does something incredible. Now, here's what I want you to see today. Here's what we see, that through Jesus, today what we, what we see is that aliens become citizens, strangers become family. And people that were from a pagan, broken culture with a broken past get to be a part of something eternally incredible. We get to be a part of that. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, what's our next step? Listen, if you're a Christian, you just, re just remember that you are a part of the most significant thing ever in the history of mankind, period, which is God's church. The one thing that goes on for eternity. Jesus Christ says that his church, not even the gates of hell can withstand it. I mean, his church is powerful, not a building, all of us that we get to be a part of something incredible and life transforming. Now listen, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't committed your life to God, what I want you to see is this, is look at all the benefits that you get from it. God says that when you give your life to him, that the same way that it's like, like somebody becomes a citizen of a, of a, of a, of a great country, that there's all kinds of benefits along with that, that God says, I want that for you. But more importantly, I want you to know that I want to be a part of your family. You're my kid. I want to have a personal relationship with you. And ultimately, the last thing, I want to have your life be a part of something so significant that it completely changes the world. And that all starts when we take our, fir our first step, which is to give our life to Jesus. If that's you here today saying, look, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. I'm ready to get, to, to, you know, Focus on him. I know where my life has been. I'm ready for him to start chipping away at, that, at all the bad and fitting me together into what he intended and created for me to be. Listen, come talk to me after the service. I'll be right up here. Right after the service, I'll be more happy to talk to you about, about you know, what your next step is. You know, or if you just have questions and you want somebody to talk to, please sign up on that Get Connected card. We'll be more happy to set up a meeting with you during the week that we can sit down and answer any questions uh, that you might have. But listen, there's a whole lot more. There's a whole lot more. Next week, we're going to do part two of what it means to be a Christian as we look at now chapter 3. Woohoo! We finished chapter 2. Yes, we're going to chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians. Let's go ahead and pray. We'll get finished up. Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for all the people here and the opportunity that today, Father, we get to see the significance of the church and what the church means. Father, we thank you so much that you love us, broken, messed up stones, people that have gone the wrong direction, Father, but yet you, you want to use our life for the, the most significant thing, which is your church. The church is what's going to transform the world, Father. And we just thank you so much that we get to be a part of that. I pray for anyone who's here who has committed their life to you, Father, that they, that they if they're not being actively involved in the church, that they sign up this week 
that, Father, you want them to be active, that you want them to be a part of this amazing thing. And through that, Father, you're going to just do some amazing things in their life and through their life. I pray for the people that are here right now, Father, that have not made a commitment with you, that they see that you are a loving Father, want to be there for your kids, and want to help them have the life that you intended and created for them to have. Can we just thank you so much, Father? We love you with all of our heart. Help us to make you proud this week. We praise you, Son, in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I want to thank you guys so much for being here. I love you, church. Have an amazing week. See you next week. Thank you.